Chapter 2 The enormous bed was clothed in Cathayan silks, its frame carved from pale Italian wood. Its engraved surfaces depicted mermen and other fabulous beasts of the sea cavorting in a most unsettling pattern of intertwined tentacles and finned tails. Velvet drapes hung from the canopy of the bed, pulled back and bound to the pillar-like bedposts by silken cords. Sprawled amid the opulence was a gigantic mound of humanity. Silk sheets concealed his nudity, his sausage-like fingers depleting a platter of soft-skinned grapes with the rapacity of a Norse berserker in a convent. But even as he indulged his hunger, the eyes that stared from the bloated face were apprehensive, drifting helplessly across the visages of the men who surrounded him. Well, Baron Friedo von Gotz demanded at last, his voice quivering in anticipation of an answer. The trio of physicians glanced towards each other, praying that one of the other would take the initiative. The aged individual hovering on the left of the bed, as feebly thin as the baron was indulgent, was the first one to blink, clearing his throat with a nervous croak. Well, Dr. Kleist began, seeming to parrot the baron's uncomfortable tone. After a careful examination, we must accept that they are certainly boils, your excellency. Kleist's hands spread out in a gesture of helplessness. Baron von Gotz growled and sputtered. Of course, there are many things that could mean, my lord. The physician to the baron's right hastily squeaked, trying to forestall the nobleman's distemper. He was a bloated creature himself, as though in emulation of his aristocratic master. His girth strained at the velveteen waistcoat that encompassed his frame. Dr. Gehring felt the baron's hopeful gaze sweep back upon him. I I should like to lance the pustules again and inspect the humor that is exuded by the wound. The baron nearly choked on the fistful of grapes he was cramming into his face. You filthy leech, he snapped. You've had enough of my blood this morning. You will get no more. He swung his attention to the doctor who had yet to speak. He was older than either of the others his head bereft of hair, his garments simple and devoid of ornamentation. Dr. Stuber maintained a neurotic fastidiousness, keeping his entire body clean-shaven to provide no breeding ground for lice or fleas, drinking vinegar every morning to turn his blood thin and prevent it from overwhelming his heart. Popular legend said that Stuber would burn his clothing after wear, refused to eat any meat unless he inspected the animal before it was slaughtered and would boil his hands after touching another person to remove any taint of disease. Even now, Stuber was wringing his slender hands before him, as though trying to scrape the contagion from his fingers. Baron von Gotz regretted allowing the physician to speak as soon as his pallid mouth snapped open. They could be communal sores, Stuber stated, with the self-righteousness of a street-corner prophet. I have warned His Excellency against dallying among the rabble. They are a breeding ground for filth of all kinds. Stuber visibly shuddered. I suggest your attitude become more helpful, Herr Doctor, the Baron warned, as Stuber's pale features faded to grey. I have plenty of room in my dungeons for malcontents. It is wrong to keep a hound in the kennel. He must be free to prowl and hunt. The fat man's face broadened into a vain smirk. After all, even a fine woman like the Baroness is not able to fulfill a robust appetite like mine. In truth, Frido's wife had not allowed him to lay a hand on her since he'd bloated into something more often seen in a stockyard than a palace. But Stuber's words gave the Baron pause. Was that all that was wrong? Was it simply the mark of some ungainly social disease? Such a minor ailment might be seen as welcome as a visit from the Emperor amid the blight that hung over Wurtbad. That may indeed be all that it is. All heads turned towards the speaker, a tall, slender man who had been sitting in one of the leather-backed chairs scattered throughout the chamber. He was younger than the physicians, 
his face dominated by the massive black beard which tumbled down to his chest. A round cap topped his head, the border embroidered with a scrolling gold leaf that matched the rich coloring of his flowing robes. A tall staff of the same metal rested against the wall, rushing into his open hand as he rose from his seat, gesturing towards it. The three doctors grumbled and muttered, unimpressed by the wizard's flaunting of his sorcery. He noted their distaste and smiled, having as little use for them as they did for him. It was time to undermine these fawning sycophants. They had misread the patient. Baron von Gotz was not interested in platitudes and placebos this morning. He was frightened, and they knew he had good reason to be, although none was willing to confirm his fears. For no doctor could offer hope to the Baron. That was the sole province of the wizard, who would use it to win favor with his patron. It may be all, the wizard repeated. But can we afford to take the risk? The question cut the fragile feelings of the physicians like a knife. And does Magister Furchtegott have some insight that he wishes to share with us? Dr. Gehring demanded. Perhaps boil a few frog legs into a broth and mumble a few elven words over it? The common brought chuckles from his fellow doctors, but the wizard was pleased to note the baron was not laughing. The solution to this problem requires scientific method, not arcane rites of dubious merit. Though Gehring laced his words with scorn and derision, there was no hiding the uncertainty that undermined them. If the wizard's star was to rise, he could well guess at whose expense that would be. There are certain rites and spells which have great facility in healing. Furch the God Stone was precise and certain. Even working their magic against such noxious maladies as stir blight. The name of the dread disease chilled the air. The wizard was pleased to note the gleam of desperate hope rekindling in the baron's eyes. Forgive me, Magister, Gehring scoffed. I was unaware that you had any facility with medicine. I had always understood that the only wizards who made the practice of healing were those of the Light Order, not the mystics of the Gold Order. But the doctor's sneer became an expression of alarm when he saw the keen interest in the nobleman's eyes. Verge the god, tell me what you need to work your spells, the baron implored. The doctors began to sputter protestations, but the nobleman waved them away with an angry gesture. I shall need some rather expensive materials, and of course the gracious indulgence of yourself, my dear baron. Verge the god struggled not to let the sense of triumph welling up within him become too obvious although he was not entirely successful. Whatever you need, you shall have, the nobleman swore. Oh, yes, the wizard thought. I am most certain of that. Once he had cured a baron of this corruption of the flesh, Furch the God would play the nobleman's gratitude for all it was worth. He would become the most powerful wizard in Wurtbad, possibly even in the entire eastern half of the empire. He would have the ruler of a mighty city eating out of his hand. Even the powerful supreme patriarch of Aldorf couldn't boast the same degree of autonomy and political influence. With the ruler of Wurtbad under his thumb, Furch the God would be able to spend the wealth of an entire city to expand both his magical library and his knowledge, far beyond what he had been taught in the Gold College of Aldorf. But a moment of worry tugged at a wizard his eyes lingering on the ugly boil just visible beneath the folds of fat dripping from the baron's chin. There was the small matter of actually curing the plague, something not even the temple of Shalia and all the physicians of the city had been able to do. Still, they did not possess the genius of Furchtegott, and they were trying to cure an entire city. Furchtegott only had to cure one man. True, the healing arts were not the central focus of a school of magic centered on the enchanted properties of gold, the most royal of metals, but Furch the God had ideas about how to rectify this omission. There were not so many mystics and mages within Wurtbad that a court wizard of Baron Frido did not know them all by name. Many of them he counted as his only friends in the sprawling metropolis. Many nights had they discussed theories on the nature of magic, 
Many times they had swapped pieces of occult knowledge. Furchtegott conjured up one name in particular, an old wizard who no longer plied his trade, but had relegated himself to the role of scholar and sage. Even if he no longer channeled the ethereal winds of magic through his old bones, he still owned an impressive library. And there was one book in particular that Furchtegott recalled with a keen interest. Hopefully, the old sage would allow his friend to borrow the tome. But if destiny decreed otherwise, Furchtegott was certain that the baron's authority could make any request quite compelling. The sprawl of Wurtbad was a dark blemish upon the horizon, the first indication to Fulman that the city was near. However, the witch hunter's attention was directed towards the more immediate activity unfolding upon the road ahead. Several dozen laborers in coarse woolen tunics were busily constructed a small watchtower from timbers they unloaded from a wagon. Other men struggled to roll huge stones onto the road, the beginnings of what promised to be a formidable obstruction. A large number of armed men were milling about, some of them sharpening their swords, others finding themselves a patch of shade to sit in. Fulman was mildly alarmed to note that the uniforms they wore were not the colors of some petty baron or count, banishing his supposition that this was a minor noble's attempt to create a toll road. The rough uniforms were the green and yellow of Stirland's standing army, the uniform of the elector count's own troops. Overseeing the operation was a mounted officer, his powerful build encased in a suit of steel plate. He watched the work crew with a keen interest, while also casting worried glances in the direction of Wurtbad. One of the soldiers, a rangy youth with a quiver of arrows hanging from his hip, rushed over and directed his attention to the two riders now approaching him. What do you make of this? Strang asked, the words slipping from the corner of his mouth. No doubt we are about to find out, Fulman replied in the same subdued tone. He noted the sound of Strang moving in his saddle. Without turning his eyes from the approaching officer, he instructed his henchman to leave the crossbow where it was. Stirland is not a wealthy province. You can wager that any soldier armed with a bow brought it with him when he was inducted, and knows how to use it. I'd rather not end my days as a pincushion, and I dare say a dozen arrows in your gut may prove an impediment to your drinking. The officer rode forwards as the archers drew their bows. The raiment of a witch-hunter was quite distinct. Fulman knew there was no question that the officer had recognized him for what he was. It was why the man was riding forward to parley, rather than chasing them off with a volley of arrows, although it seemed he was keeping that option open. "'Good day, Templar,' the officer greeted Fulman, holding the grey gilding he rode at several horse lengths away from the witch-hunter. "'Good day, Captain.' the witch-hunter replied, noting the oflique badges upon the collar over the soldier's breastplate that displayed his rank. "'You look to be very busy here,' the officer's face grew solemn. "'It's plague,' he said, letting the menacing word linger on the air. "'I fear that if you have business in the city, you will not be able to pursue it. By order of the elector count, the city is under quarantine. No one goes in, no one comes out.' Fulman fixed the officer with a stare that had caused many a warlock or heretic cultist to break out in a cold sweat. I am on the temple's business. I must go to the city to complete my holy work. You do your uniform credit by your efficiency, but I must ask you that you let us pass. Did you not hear me? The city is infested with the plague. Graf Haupt Anderson doesn't want a contagion infesting the rest of the province. If it is not already too late. He has nearly two thousand men setting a cordon around the city, and the river patrol is keeping ships away from the port. I fear no pestilence, Fulman retorted. I am upon Sigmar's business. Surely the will of a god overrides the edict of a man, even if he is the elector count. My apologies, Templar, but I have my orders. There was a tone of genuine regret in the officer's voice. I can let no one pass through the cordon. It looks to me like you haven't finished setting up your cordon, Strang piped up, pointing to where the work crews struggled to erect the tower and block the road. The officer shook his head. 
Sighing, he reached an autonomous decision. As you are going into the city, and you are a Templar, I will not block your path. But I advise against it. The disease is decimating Vurbat, they say. Hundreds are dead already, and it will only get worse. Especially when food becomes scarce and winter sets in. Nevertheless, that is where my duty takes me, Thulman insisted. The officer moved his horse to one side of the road, waving back to the troops to allow the witch hunter to pass. A word of warning, Templar, the officer said. Once you pass my post, there is no return. My orders are quite clear. Even Sigmar himself will not find a way out of this city, until the elect account lifts the quarantine anyway. I didn't like all that talk about plague, Streng confessed, once they were out of sight of the guard's post. Are you certain this is a good idea? Fulman gave his henchman a cold smile. Have faith, Streng, the witch hunter told him. Sigmar protects his servants. Perhaps he can spare some protection for you as well. And if that is not comfort enough, consider that, as a result of our activities in Klausberg, you'll be liberating some of the gold from the treasury at Miser's chapter house. Thin bit of good that'll do me if all the whores have the plague, the mercenary grumbled. I was in Wissenbad when the red pox hit it. After a couple of months, the beer was so scarce, even two crowns could barely buy a pint. Streng leaned over in the saddle, spitting into the brush beside the road as though to rid himself of the memory. We should have gone back to Klausberg and laid low until the plague was done in Wurtbad. We don't have the leisure to waste that much time, Thulman said. You seem to forget that we are still on the hunt. Is it vice? The witch hunter nodded his head. I don't think he'd be fool enough to linger in a city infested by plague, Strang snapped back. Quite the contrary. The good doctor would probably find the pestilence a perfect cover for his experiments, Fulman declared. He'd find any number of willing subjects for his experiments if he offered them a cure for the plague. Besides, we have other business in Vurbad as well, besides picking up the trail of Freiherr Weiss. The book? Streng sucked at his teeth, considering the unholy tome that brought ruin to the Klausner family. It's been safe in Vurbat this long. Surely a few more months won't change that matter. You forget that a vampire is looking for it too, Thulman stated. He knows now that the Klausners no longer have it in their keeping. We can't take the chance that Sibekai may find it before us, and a little thing like a plague isn't enough to keep him from Vurbat if he learns the book is there. So, where do we begin? Streng demanded. It appeared there would be no night of debauchery before getting back to work. You start by securing lodgings for us, Thulman told him. Don't skimp on stables for the horses either. With plague abroad, I want them kept somewhere they are not likely to get slaughtered for meat. Then you'll arrange for me to occupy my old rooms at the Seven Candles. I am sure the innkeeper will be pleased to see us back so soon. And what will you do while I'm doing all the errands? Streng said in a surly tone. Our first priority is to locate Helmuth Klausner's spell book. Towards that end, I think it will be prudent to visit our friend Captain Meiser. Even an incompetent fool like him must keep a record of wizards operating in the city. The man we are looking for should be on that list. At least, if he is still in the city, Fulman added. Fritz Gotter leaned a bandaged hand against a cold stone wall as a racking cough shook his body. The baker lifted his other hand to his mouth when the spasm had passed, hoping not to find blood trickling out of it. His hope was in vain. The disease was chewing up his innards as surely as it was disfiguring his flesh. Thankfully, it hadn't reached his face yet, allowing him to conceal his malady from his patrons. It was doubtful if anyone would buy bread from a baker whose face was covered in stir blight boils. The sickly baker descended a short flight of stairs to the cellar where he kept his supplies. With the quarantine in effect, no more ships were coming into the harbor, no supplies to feed Wurtbad's teeming masses. 
the demand for food was already rising as people began to stockpile rations against the winter. The quarantine was like tossing oil into a fire. There was a great deal of money to be made, money that Fritz Gotter could use to pay for the plague doctor's regular visits. Gotter sniffed at a tunic he wore beneath the apron, wincing at the smell. It still carried the lilac perfume scent left by the doctor after the visit. Gotter disliked the smell. It made him feel like a three-shilling tart down by the harbor. Still, it was a minor inconvenience, when you balanced it against the prospect of a slow and horrible death. The baker paused on the bottom step, allowing his eyes to adjust to the gloom. He could see the stacks of flour heaped in the corner, a few barrels of honey sitting beside them. The sound of furtive scurrying made his face twist in disgust. The damnable rats were back. The filthy things were too shrewd to waste their time with Gotter's sawdust-ridden bread. No, they went straight for the flour, and never managed to stumble into the many traps the baker had set out for them. Sometimes it seemed to Gotter that the vermin were almost human-like in their intelligence. He picked an old table leg from a small pile of junk beside the stairway, slapping the improvised weapon into the palm of his hand. He had trouble enough with rats eating away at his income, but soon there would be a few less of the vermin to bother with. The baker began to creep across the cellar, straining to prevent even the softest noise betraying his approach. He knew that even in the dim light streaming down from the stairway, he'd be perfectly visible to the thieving rodents. His only chance to catch them would be if they remained occupied with their stolen supper. Gotter glanced down at the floor to ensure there was no clutter underfoot to stumble on. As he did so, the color drained out of his face. A thin coating of dust covered the floor, remnants of the cheap mix that went into the bread. Something had disturbed that dust. There were tracks on the floor, the clawed footmarks of rats, only bigger, much bigger. Gotter peered into the darkness in the corners of the cellar, conjuring up shapes without form or distinction. His mind raced with horrors recollected from childhood, frightful tales told to terrify the unruly child. Be a good boy, Fritz, his mother used to say, or the underfolk will come and get you. The baker shuddered, tears rising unbidden to his eyes, blurring his gaze even as they darted from side to side straining to see every inch of the cellar. The faint scurrying persisted, and Gotter was certain he could smell something that was not flour, nor sawdust, nor the mustiness of the room. The stench of mangy fur, of rank verminous breath, of rotting meat caught between sharp fangs. A cough began to gather in his chest. The baker fought to contain the spasm, his eyes on those hideous tracks. Sigmar, preserve me! he prayed. I'll never take advantage of anyone that lives again. I'll make honest bread with real flour. Just let me make it back to the stairs. Don't let them see me. Even as the thought crossed his mind, there was movement among the shadows of the flower stacks. Red eyes gleamed out of the darkness, seeming to peer straight into the soul of Gotter. The baker fought to move, tried to turn and flee back up the stairs, but the only response from his paralyzed body was a trickle of urine that spilled down his leg. The shadow began to slink forward. More red eyes winked into existence, glaring at him from the darkness. The cuff he had been suppressing wheezed out of his mouth in a choking rattle, its strength diminished by the terror surging in his mind. The shape became more distinct as it emerged into the dim light. Gotter tried to look away, tried to shut his eyes, but his body refused to obey even so small a command. It was the size of a man. Its outlines suggested the basic human form. Tattered scraps of leather and filthy cloth clung to its shape after the fashion of a tunic and kilt. But it was not a man. Unclean brown fur covered most of its form, save where it faded to a mangy white upon its belly and throat. The hands were tipped with sharp claws, like some obscene talons. From the creature's hindquarters, a long naked tail twitched and writhed. Its face was pulled into a long muzzle, whiskers surrounding its nose, huge incisors protruding out of its mouth. The red eyes considered him with a pitiless malevolence, a spite beyond human comprehension. 
The monster stalked forward, its movement cautious. Gother almost gave a nervous laugh as he noticed the faint white powder staining the creature's muzzle, realizing what had actually been stealing his grain and flour. But his paralyzed body was too rebellious to embrace the onset of madness. The skaven raised its face, sniffing at the air. The monster gave voice to a sound, part hiss and part squeak. Other lurking shadows skittered forward, revealing themselves as the creature's noxious kin. The first of the skaven scuttled right up to Gotter, its muzzle sniffing at his clothes. As the ratman hissed, two more of the monsters hurried forward. A black paw pulled the table leg from Gotter's grasp while other inhuman hands closed upon his shoulders and arms. Their touch snapped the baker out of his paralysis. Gotter kicked and struggled in their grasp, a wretched moan quivering past his lips. But the skaven were unmoved, pulling him into the darkness. The sound of grinding stone rumbled through the cellar. Gotter watched in terror as a portion of the wall fell inward, revealing the black opening of a tunnel. Take, take! The first skaven chittered. Doctor man like like, grace ear like like, reward match match. The other ratmen laughed at their leader's pronouncement. Gotter joined their hideous merriment as his mind broke. The skaven, undisturbed by his madness, carried him forth into the tunnel. Fritz has been a bad boy, mummy. Gotter giggled as the blackness loomed toward him. And now the underfolk have come to take him away. The baker's laughter faded as the door slowly closed behind him.